Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everybody. My name is Sandro Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to today's public health conversation, the first of 2024. These events are meant as spaces for the free speech, open debate, and generative exchange of ideas that shape a healthier world. Guided by experts, we aim to sharpen our thinking about what matters most for health. Thank you for joining today's conversation. A particular thank you to the Dean's office and our communications teams, without whose efforts these conversations would not take place. Health is inextricable from the economic forces that shape our lives. Our health is supported by assets like good food, safe homes and neighborhoods, and quality of education. Our access to these assets is fundamentally a matter of money, of economic policy. Today, we're going to discuss how we can engage with economic policy to create a healthier world. I very much look forward to learning from all our speakers as the conversation unfolds. I'm pleased to introduce today's moderator, Stephanie Ilgenfritz. Stephanie is Coverage Chief Health and Science and the Editorial Director of the Future of Everything for the Wall Street Journal. She leads a prize-winning team of reporters and editors who covered hospital health insurance, pharmaceutical and medical device industries, as well as medicine and science. She oversees the Wall Street Journal's Future Reverting section that explores nascent trends that will shape our world. Stephanie, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dean Galea, for that introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here with everybody today. To get us started, I'll, uh, I'll introduce our speakers for the program. First, we will have uh, Dr. Brittany Brown Podgorski, Assistant Professor of Health Policy and Management in the Graduate School of Public Health at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Brown Podgorski's research examines the policy environment as a social determinant of health and health disparities. She is particularly interested in how state, social, economic, and health policies influence cardiovascular risk, outcomes, and disparities among low-income and minoritized populations. After that, we will turn to Mark Dugan, Trion Director of the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research and the Wayne and Jody Cooperman Professor of Economics at Stanford University. Professor Dugan's research focuses on the healthcare sector and on the effects of government expenditure programs such as Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid on the behavior of individuals and firms. He is also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management. And then we will hear from Rourke O'Brien, a professor of sociology and director of undergraduate studies at Yale University. His research focuses on the causes and consequences of social and economic inequalities with substantive interests in taxation, household finance, and population health. And then finally, we will hear from Kosali Simon, Distinguished Professor Herman B. Wells Endowed Professor and O'Neill Chair at Indiana University's Paul H. O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs. Dr. Simon is a nationally known health economist who specializes in applying economic analysis in the context of health insurance and health care policy. It's quite a program today, um, but to kick things off, let's start with Dr. Brown Podgorski. Over to you. Um. As Stephanie mentioned, I'm Dr. Brittany Brown Podgorski, and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Pittsburgh School of Public Health in the Department of Health Policy and Management. And today, I'm going to just briefly touch on um, the inter intertwined relationship between economic hardship, health, and the potential role of minimum wage policy specifically um, to improve that relationship. So I will provide a brief overview of um, health and social determinants of health, discuss how we define and or measure economy and the economy in the U.S., um, talk briefly about the relationship between economic hardship and health, and then lastly, talk about some evidence that we currently have out there in the literature on the potential or the current impact of minimum wage policies on health. And so to kind of kick things off, I want to talk about the fact that we have shifted away from the traditional um, model of how we see health and getting past this idea that health is merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Instead, we think about health in a more holistic way. And so this having a, a helpful diet, living in, in an environment that is um, conducive to overall well-being um, physical activity, that sort of thing, and just really getting beyond this idea that health is specific to um, the absence of disease 
and healthcare, the utilization of healthcare, how you need healthcare, while healthcare is important to our health and our health outcomes, um, we know that it only accounts for 10 to 20% of what it means to be healthy. The rest of that, the, the remaining 80 to 90% is actually attributable, attributable to social determinants of health, which is that broad social context in which individuals live, work, age, um, play um, over the life course and how those influence their um, overall health. And so thinking about that and thinking about health and well-being as from the holistic perspective, we really need to focus on that social context and the fact that social determinants of health and health itself don't just occur, right? We have this larger social, economic, and political context that really feeds into that. And so this framework from the, from the WHO really kind of puts that in a visual form where we are able to see that health and more broadly that social, economic, and political context are, are really um, shaped by policy um, and our um, economy and government and the important role that those factors and that context really plays on um, trajectory through to health and well-being um, over the life course. But what do we really mean when we say the economy? We can speak kind of broadly um, based off of definitions that are available just by a quick um, internet search. And so the system of, of production, distribution, and consumption of goods and services in a given area, or the structure or conditions of economic life in a given area. But while that's great, that's a, a very concise definition, what does that mean? What are the inputs? And so just looking at the um, Bureau of Economic Analysis, some of the important factors that are often included in their snapshot reports of the U.S. economy include your gross net domestic pol um, product, personal income and spending, um, investment, personal discretionary spending and income, government fi finances, consumption, import, export, labor and workforce, those sorts of factors. But the one thing that stands out for me and many of many of you I'm sure as well, is that all of these things are driven by the individuals that are within our country and how they actually are what are the, is the driving force behind the U.S. economy. And so that is important to consider given that individuals who experience economic hardship or really struggle financially, um, economic hardship we can define as the inability to pay for your bills or have any extra spending money. It's often in the literature, it can be defined or named for social economic status or poverty or material hardship when you're kind of looking through the literature. But individuals who face economic hardship are at increased risk of negative health outcomes over the life course. And that can include just overall health, mental health um, and physical health the um, health of their, their offspring. Um, and then more specifically, um, we can get down to how economic hardship actually increases the risk of diabetes, um, heart disease, and even premature mortality. So thinking about the fact that economic hardship or having the funds you need to um, not only pay your bills, but just live and survive in life, can really is can really be tied to um, labor and wage policies, wage policies specifically. And here in the US, with um, a lot of the discussion has been around minimum wage policy as a specific um, lever that we can um, pull to improve economic hardship and thus um, health in US households. And states individual states have the authority to really increase those wages above the federal limit for workers in their, their jurisdictions, and many, um, 30 states plus, the D, plus DC, have done so. However, the evidence of the effectiveness of such increases have been mixed, especially when we're talking about um, health. For example, the benefits that we see with minimum, associated with minimum wage, wage increases have been improved social economic status, reduced um, psychosocial stress, improvements in access to health resources and other resources that influence health, as well as improved overall health. However, there have been some unintended consequences. Uh, minimum wage increases have been found to be associated with higher body mass index or obesity, tobacco use, poor quality diet, and importantly, the impact of minimum wage policy can tends to vary by um, individual social factors such as gender, 
and race, suggesting these policies themselves can impact groups, especially more vulnerable groups in a different, in a different way. And so just to conclude and um, kind of start off the discussion, individuals and their families are the foundation of the U.S. economy. However, individuals who are experiencing economic hardship have worse health. Those that poorer health can lead to even greater economic hardship, and that in turn, in fact, in turn affects everyone um, and leads to an, uh, having negative impacts on the economy. Policies that improve wages, such as the minimum wage increase, could potentially be a solution to that, to improving economic hardship and thus um, improving health. However, this will require large scale changes that um, look at health and beyond just the economy, but also the trickle down or um, other impacts of the economy on the individual experience. And the changes cannot be incremental. We've been doing that. And unfortunately, at this time, we're seeing that that may not be the best strategy for um, addressing wage and um, hardship. And so that is the conclusion of my presentation. And I will turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown Podolsky, for that. I uh, am already seeing questions from the audience in response to your presentation. So I was going to suggest to the audience, please keep them coming, and we will leave some time at the end to answer as just as many of them as we can. Um, for now, I will turn it over to our next presenter, Dr. Dugan. Over to you. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and thanks to the organizers for including me in today's event. I'm really uh, excited to be here. Uh, I am I have a long history with BU in the sense that both of my parents are alumni of BU, so I, I have a special fondness uh, for the institution. But I'm going to talk, uh, build on some of the uh, remarks from the previous speaker. I'm going to try to share my screen, and it's possible that I will, that this will, I hope that I do this very efficiently. And I'm going to try to that is not, so I want to go to display settings, I believe. Is that looking, can anyone give me a thumbs up, Kosley? Does that look good? Okay, great. All right, well, thank you so much uh, for uh, for being, uh, for including me today. And I'm just going to talk about several things uh, rather than one thing, high level, that I think are uh, very top of mind for me uh, lately when thinking about the U.S. economy, the health of the population. Uh, I'm Like, recently, I'm certainly... Uh, paying attention to the what's happened to people's health over the last few years. Uh, we have seen, and I'm going to just give a quick bullet points here and then go a little more deeply into several points, uh, but there are questions about how long the recovery will take, and I'm going to talk about that. The second thing that I want to talk about is something that uh, 15 years ago, I had the honor to work in uh, President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors on the Affordable Care Act, and at that time, uh, something that we were uh, very focused on was the rapidly rising share of our economy that was being devoted to healthcare spending. Uh, from 2000 to 2010, it rose from 13 to 17%. And I think one thing that I haven't, and, and at the time, the projections from the leading sort of uh, uh, the leading uh, individuals or organizations in DC were that that spending growth was going to continue when in fact, over the last dozen years, healthcare spending as a share of GDP hasn't really moved in the US, which is pretty incredible. And I encourage, everyone to reflect on that because CBO, for example, projected that by now we'd be 25% of GDP. I want to talk a bit about the steadily growing role of Medicaid and Medicare. These are very important programs that currently insure 140 million Americans, and they have just become more and more important over time as a result of both demographics and policy changes, such as the Affordable Care Act. Within those programs, there has been a just a really massive shift over time from fee-for-service reimbursement of the programs to hospitals, doctors, and others, uh, to basically contracting out that care to private insurance companies with through a growth in Medicare Advantage and Medicaid managed care. Private, while there has been a huge increase in public health insurance in the US, there has been a corresponding decline in the public, public provision. And as I'll show you uh, in some current research, I'm looking at what are the consequences of that decline in, in public hospitals on uh, well-being uh, of, uh, of individuals. Given we're talking about the economy and health today, I do want to point out that in recent years, earnings and wealth 
inequality in the U.S. Uh, uh, have been declining, which uh, it's hard to know what the effect of that will be on health, but that is promising. And you know, one of the reasons I think that we in the U.S. have life expectancy three or four years lower than other industrialized countries has, you know, people have uh, estimated that, that our inequality here is a contributor to that. And then finally, I want to talk a bit about deaths of despair and where we think those are going to be headed in the years ahead. So a lot of topics here. Uh, here you can just see, I'll just quickly show that at life expectancy at birth uh, had been trending up for both men and women uh, through 2019. And as we all know, that took a major hit in 2020 uh, and in 2021. And it appears that we are recovering uh, with the hope being that we will get back on a good trajectory uh, in the not too, uh, 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 to the previous trajectory or even higher in the not too distant future. But even before the pandemic had come along, you can see that life expectancy was growing uh, more slowly uh, in the US than previously. And that is something that I'll talk a bit about at the end with the deaths of despair. Uh, the, the recovery of uh, life expectancy, uh, so it has recovered as, as you saw from that previous figure uh, from 2021, 2020 to 2022, things are bouncing back a bit. And the, the extent to which they're bouncing back has varied quite a lot across groups with underrepresented minorities still, in, still uh, having more, uh, having been hit harder, at least with respect to life expectancy uh, over these years. So the hope that 2022, 23, 24, and so forth, that we're, um, that we're back to uh, no longer in deficit from where we were at in 2019. Uh, I, I want to. I, I, most of my research focuses on the healthcare sector uh, and government expenditure programs, and I think it is really remarkable to me that it, here we are today with healthcare spending as a share of the economy, just basically where it was when Obamacare was passed in 2010. And I think at that time, if you think about how much more money, pretty much everyone was projecting we were going to be spending now on healthcare. Uh, than we are and thinking of reflecting on how where has that money gone? That's 6% of GDP that we thought we were going to be spending on healthcare, $4,500 a person. How has that uh, benefited us as a, as a country? Uh, it has freed up national income for other goods and services, um, and it has reduced pressure on federal and state budgets relative to what was projected. Uh, one of the important findings is that Medicare spending has been growing more slowly than expected, and that has uh, made our budget situation less uh, negative. It's not great, uh, even with this improvement. Uh, but how were the projections so off the mark? Or maybe it was driven by policy. Maybe it is literally the case that the Affordable Care Act and other policies have caused healthcare spending to uh, uh, you know, basically level off as a share of GDP. And, that, and people were pretty terrified about that 15 years ago, also about the high share uninsured. Um, or, or is it the growing role of public insurance? Public health insurance tends to cost, uh, cost less on average. And so that could be a contributor. I just pulled up some data from uh, the last 20 years on what is the changing role of health insurance in the US. And I think it's pretty incredible what has happened during that time period as someone who studies the sector. If you look at employer-sponsored insurance, the majority of Americans get their health insurance through their employer or a family member's employer. But just in absolute numbers, that has actually, if anything, declined since 2000. It's only modestly increased since 2010. It's 4% decline since, uh, that should be, by the way, 2000 to 2022. Now, 2020 to 2022. Uh, Medicare, you can see huge increase. A lot of that is driven by the aging population, but Medicaid, just absolutely incredible. 34 million individuals enrolled in Medicaid in 2000, 91 million. If you add in CHIP, that gets to 98 million as of 2022. There have been some disenrollments early this year in, in 2024, but it is really just remarkable how much this program has increased. And Medicaid is the focus of my very first paper as a graduate student. And if you had told me in the late 1990s that Medicaid would be enrolling almost 100 million Americans, I would have thought that was, I couldn't have even imagined that then. It's a huge change in our uh, in our country. And it, and that has been associated, there's research showing that that's helped improve our health as a, as a nation. You can see uninsured has declined, but it's still the case that there are a non-trivial number of uninsured uh, individuals. Um, but really the, the growing role of Medicare and Medicaid, if there's one thing I wanna flag today, that is just a first order change in the economy. It's more than doubled since 2000, whereas private insurance hasn't really moved much. And it's likely that there will be further increases in Medicaid enrollment in the coming years. 10 states have still not expanded Medicaid as called for in the Affordable Care Act. Some of the highest population states too, including Texas and Florida, the second and third most populous states in the US. It's very plausible that these states will, so only about half of states immediately expanded Medicaid when they could 10 years ago. Um, and in the 
10 years since, many states, one by one, have come in and expanded Medicaid. And it seems plausible that that uh, some of these 10 will as well, which would lead to further increase in the role of Medicaid in our healthcare system. I do want to call attention to these, the, the growing role of public health insurance has coincided with a growing reliance of public health insurance on private insurance, which is really a, a sort of an interesting change. So private insurers, while they're getting basically less commercial business from ESI, employer-sponsored insurance, they're getting more and more from Medicare and from Medicaid. So you can see here as a share of Medicare recipients, now more than half are enrolled in Medicare Advantage, private health insurance uh, and, and Medicaid enrollment. Now more than 80% of Medicaid uh, recipients are enrolled in private managed care plans. And that is really a, just a gigantic change. Medicare and Medicaid between the two account for almost $2 trillion in government spending. Um, and increasingly, that money is going not directly to hospitals and physicians, but to private insurers who are then coordinating and financing the care. That This changing role of public health insurance in the background, one thing that people have focused much less on, and that is focused on my own recent research with Atul Gupta, Emily Jackson, and Zachary Templeton, is a decline in public hospital capacity in the U.S. So if you look over the last 35 or so years, there's been a steady decline in the share of hospitals that are owned and operated by state and local governments. That's the top series. And then federal federal hospitals have also declined over time. And is that good for uh, individuals or not? And public hospitals are often in many communities considered to be the providers of last resort. And it is. Um, and so is it the case that the growth in public insurance has made less and less necessary to have a provider of last res resort, a public hospital? Um, that's some of what we're exploring in our research. I will say that uh, inequality in the U.S. by many measures has been growing for decades. Uh, recent research, uh, recent evidence from the Census Bureau suggests that this may be declining. Earnings have been declining more rapidly for low-income individuals than for high-income individuals. And uh, so that may ripple through to, because to the extent that Related to uh, Brit Pro Professor Brown of Pod Podgorsky's previous presentation, additional income for low-income families may have a high bang for the buck in improved health going forward. So that could make a big difference. And some of this, I think, has also been driven by minimum wage increases, which have really been uh, quite striking, though varying across places. Here in California, $16 an hour. In Texas, $7.25 an hour. And many states in between those two extremes. Um, and then finally, I'll just say something about deaths of despair. It, it's obviously uh, a, a big issue for the country, something that's really affected our uh, life expectancy at the national level. Part of the reason that our life expectancy was slowing even before the pandemic has been just a huge increase, steady increase in suicide rates since basically uh, 2000, and an even more jarring increase in drug overdose death rates. And you know, the hope, my hope, and and uh, is that this these these trends, these very troubling trends, if we were to be looking at this 20 years from now would show a reversal of this upward pattern. But that is, you know, there's a lot of complicated factors that have been driving this increase. And many of them don't have much to do with the healthcare sector, but what's happening in the economy and in society more generally. But I think this is a very high priority, um, you know, along with, and in eight minutes, I don't have time to do, to do, to cover everything, but it is, uh, this is, this is clearly a high priority for, for us as the research community to figure out how we can, uh, as a nation, move in a better direction here. So with that, I will stop sharing and I will uh, hand off to the next speaker who I believe may be Rourke, Professor O'Brien. Or maybe it's Professor Simon, I'm sorry. I'm... Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Uh, next up will be Dr. O'Brien. Great, thanks so much. Um, thanks for the introduction, Stephanie. Um, greetings to my fellow panelists, honored to be on this uh, panel with you. And thanks to Dean Glea and the folks at BU for organizing um, this discussion. Um, uh, as mentioned, my name is Rourke O'Brien. I'm a sociologist and social demographer at, at Yale University. Uh, what I wanted to do today is share a little bit of the research from um, the Opportunity for Health Lab, which I'm a part of. Um, it's led by my colleague, Athene Bengataramani at Penn Medicine. He's a physician and economist. Um, and we are a group of interdisciplinary social scientists that are uh, laser focused on the kind of the topic of today. And that's the relationship between uh, the economy and population health, and really trying to think of one side of the equation, how changes to the economy uh, might help us understand some of these kind of worrying population health trends that we've been talking about today, uh, including exactly where Mark left off his presentation, this kind of rise in these kind of really worrying uh, deaths of despair. Um, so just to, just to kind of frame kind of uh, short remarks today, just kind of two points of, of provocation I wanna kind of put out there uh, for our conversation. 
the first is that this um, that I really do think that declining economic opportunity is a is a key driver of America's worsening population health trends. Um, and then and then the second point, which kind of doubles down on that observation, is that uh, you know from our perspective, we think that public policy that specifically promotes economic opportunity is the only way to reverse America's health decline, right? So we really think that um, the solution to improving America's population health actually uh, 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 sits in how we think about structuring the economy for the 21st century, sharing the gains in wealth that our economy generates, uh, and making sure we have an adequate safety net. And that those are going to be more important to shaping population health over the next few decades uh, than, uh, than actual changes to the healthcare system. Um, so what's the kind of big thesis? So our big thesis is pretty straightforward. Basically that these macroeconomic shifts that we kind of all are, 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 are very aware of from globalization to automation have really reduced economic opportunity in America and particularly for Americans without a college degree. Um, we've all seen the many charts that are out there that basically show that we now have become kind of two Americas when it comes to kind of health trajectories and health outcomes with that bachelor's degree being that dividing line. Uh, and of course, I don't think it's because there's any kind of secrets that we learn in the college classroom. Instead, it's that college degree provides uh, uh, some people access to that knowledge economy, that's those status, those benefits that come with it. Um, whereas those who don't have that credential increasingly find themselves completely locked out of, 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 of the opportunity structures in this country. And we think that that is what's behind these kind of worrying population health trends. Um, so how do we know that? So what I just want to do kind of in the next few minutes is, is share a few bits of empirical evidence that we have um, uh, that I think are illustrative of kind of this broader uh, uh, research agenda. Um, before I do that, of course, we do love uh, 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 kind of flow diagrams, but just to develop our intuition a little bit, um, uh, we have many of these different diagrams in our lab trying to think about the, the different pathways. Um, but uh, uh, here, we're, we're trying to make the point that there are multiple ways to think about how economic opportunity, be it real or perceived, uh, can, can actually show up in um, people's physical and mental health. So of course, one direct way is that if you happen to be in a, in a place or in a community or a time where there's um, lots of uh, good education opportunities, good labor market opportunities, that's going to uh, probably increase the likelihood you get a high quality job. And we know that higher income, access to healthcare, all of these things lead to more positive health behaviors and health outcomes. Um, at the same time, if you find yourself in a place with high opportunity, you might be more likely to invest in your own human capital. So there we can think of, of course, education and skills training, but we can also think of our own health as a source of human capital, right? If you see that there's this potential for the future, you're more likely to invest in yourself now. And that's gonna, I think, play out in the way that you treat yourself physically, the way you treat your body and the way you think about the future. And that's this last, this kind of middle box here. We really do think that there uh, 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 is a growing body of evidence that, that the way people consider their own aspirations and expectations for the future, and quite simply, the extent to which people have hope for the future, that things will get better, that they're able to self-actualize, that this will also kind of show up in, in our health statistics at both the individual and population level. So that's a little bit about how we think about the, the relationship between opportunity and health in our lab. And now I just want to show you some kind of uh, 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 empirical studies to try to uh, better connect these dots. So the first is this is this question about, yeah, this kind of uh, uh, increase in deaths of despair, this kind of generalized increase or stagnation in mortality uh, that we've seen over the last few decades. And one of the basic things that we've been doing is trying to make the case that, well, the United States is a very large and heterogeneous country. Uh, and so one of the things that we can see if we break down these top line national statistics and, and look at place-based measures, we see that it's in the parts of the country where there's low opportunity, that's where we're seeing these kind of higher elevated risk of mortality. So here we're taking as a measure of economic opportunity, um, these estimates of intergenerational economic mobility from the Opportunity Insights crowd. Those of you might have seen this um, uh, image before in the New York Times, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, shows up uh, pretty often, really captures the imagination. And this is just asking what's basically the likelihood that a low income child uh, uh, in pre, uh, uh, moves up the income distribution in adulthood, right? So achieves that American dream of upward mobility. Um, and on this map, um, the red colors are, are less mobility. So we're saying there's less opportunity and the lighter colors, there's more. And basically what we're, what we're able to see is that uh, it's in those parts of the country that are characterized by low levels of opportunity that we see this elevated mortality level. Now, of course, as social scientists, we all know that um, uh, uh, good and bad things tend to be kind of correlated. Good goes with good, bad goes with bad. 
But if we wanted to think about kind of the change over time, so uh, over the last few decades, again, where we've seen this jump in uh, a middle-aged mortality, especially among non-Hispanic white population, that that too, that that's a secular trend we can talk about at the national level. But when you break it down locally, we see it really is in those parts of the country that are characterized by this low level of opportunity, low level of upward mobility, that it's in those parts of the countries that we've seen the biggest jump in midlife mortality among non-Hispanic whites over the last few decades, right? So trying to get a little more texture, trying to understand that these deaths of despair, right, are really responding to some structural realities about what the economy is doing on the ground, and, and, and frankly, the lack of opportunity uh, uh, for certain segments of our population. Um, so part of what we're also trying to do beyond these kind of broader descriptive studies is trying to really uh, 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 make the case that uh, acute and long-run changes to the economy uh, uh, can help us understand changes in population health. So one of the things we've been trying to think about is, of course, this, this global trend of deindustrialization, which has hit in certain parts of our country, and trying to think, what is it like to be in a community where the local economy is really anchored on uh, uh, some sort of heavy manufacturing or heavy industry? Uh, and what happens when that disappears? Uh, uh, can we trace that through not just to uh, employment and income and poverty measures versus standard, but can we trace that through actually to population health outcomes? So in this first study, which I'm just showing a few snapshots on the screen, what we did was we matched counties in the, around the year 2000 um, uh, around the country that, that had um, uh, 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 automotive uh, assembly plant, um, heavy industry. These were typically rural communities or exurban communities where this was the major employer in town. And then we followed those over the next two decades. And we just compared the health outcomes of folks in the community where those plants stayed open versus plant, those in the community where a plant happened to close. And what you see on the right there is that in those communities where the plants closed, we saw in pretty short order an 85% relative increase in all-cause mortality, right? So this is basically, I think, a good signal that in these communities, when work disappears, especially if it's the uh, uh, only or major employer of folks who do not have a college degree, that this has an acute and, and, and rather immediate effect on population health outcomes. And of course, mortality, right, being kind of one of the most uh, uh, kind of devastating measures uh, uh, that we can have. So this, I think, is this kind of first order evidence that, again, when work disappears in a community, we see that instantly that shows up in the health statistics of, of that community. We can also think about these long run trends. So that was thinking about what happens when a plant closes, but what about, right, as plants begin to substitute away from human workers uh, and towards the use of industrial robots. Um, so here we're building on work in economics um, uh, where they show that the arrival of these industrial robots, and here you can think like in that picture, those orange arms that are reprogrammable on, that can be put to work on manufacturing floors. Um, when they arrive, this technology arrives in the 1990s and 2000s in the US, it displaces uh, many workers, right? Because um, uh, uh, again, they can be reprogrammed to do things that previously could only be done by humans. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of evidence that the arrival of this technology uh, displaced workers, led to increases in, in, in uh, unemployment, and, and also drove declines in wages in the local community. So we just wanted to simply ask, well, do we see it show up in the population health outcomes of that community? And the answer there is yes, absolutely. So communities that were uh, uh, exposed to this increase in industrial automation from the rise of these robots, uh, we saw uh, jumps in all-cause mortality uh, for both men and women uh, uh, from both younger cohorts all the way into that middle age. Uh, and what you note in these graphs, right, is that a lot of that's being driven uh, by the increase in deaths and despair, particularly those drug overdose deaths that, that Mark mentioned. Um, but also we see increases in, say, cardiovascular disease for, for men in late middle age. And I think one of the big takeaways from this study is that the effects that we estimate here are much larger than they would be if it was just limited to uh, affected workers. So it's really undermining the health of the entire community, right? When these jobs disappear, it's spilling over and affecting the health of everyone. Uh, in this study, we also found that there was some moderating effects by state policy. So this gets to, to Brittany and Mark's work as well. So in those communities where there was more generous social safety nets, we see the effects were attenuated, but only just, right? There's only so much the safety net can do. So we think that American economic policy has really hastened these economic shifts and failed to create new pathways to economic security. Uh, and here we can't just rely on the safety net, um, and they can really moderate the effects of the economy of mortality, but only a bit, especially when we've constructed a safety net that is really prioritizing workers. So things like the earned income tax credit are quite generous, but they're restricted to workers with a job. 
Um, and that matters because where there are quality jobs, where there is a strong safety net, we do see less mortality. One little note is we, we're trying to think now of, of examples of the opposite direction, right? Where we see increases in, in quality jobs, where there's investments in local places, does that have near-term positive uh, uh, population health impacts? This is a lovely paper that shows that it does. This is looking at um, the rise of, of demand for blue-collar work um, uh, by variation in the fracking industry, which might have negative health consequences for other reasons, but at least it looks like the job availability, availability of quality jobs leads to improved health outcomes in that community. Um, I'll just leave, I'll just end on these kind of kind of thinking about what does this mean for policy. Uh, one, of course, I think there's a, a lot we need to do to increase income supports and strengthen the safety nets to make it so that, that workers who uh, lose their jobs aren't able to access jobs, that it isn't so high stakes, right? That they're still able to uh, 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 lead a quality of life. So this means expanding the, the, the child tax credit, the earned income tax credit, and trying to think about supports for non-workers. It means expanding access to Medicaid, and it also means making our disability programs, which play a really important role in our safety net, more flexible and compatible with work. And of course, it means overall trying to make sure that people's paychecks go further on the things that matter, right? Childcare, education, and housing, where the, the risk of increase in costs has far outstripped increase in wages. It also means investing directly in inequality jobs through the industrial policy. This is, I think, a really exciting thing coming out of the Biden administration, from the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Bill, uh, uh, that this is really, I think, uh, uh, um, signaling, I, I hope, a sea change in, in U.S. policy that really gets to number three, and that's being uh, deliberate about making uh, a significant place-based investments, right? We know the parts of this country that are being kind of disproportionately uh, negatively impacted by changes in the economy, and we also know those parts of the country that are receiving, you know, huge largesses of taxable wealth because of, you know, the, the, the rise of the knowledge economy on the coast. So how do we think about sharing some of that wealth, not just to households, but also to places, to struggling communities, uh, and that that itself can be seen as an investment in population health? So I'll leave this up as just a, a link for our lab for more work, and I'm really excited for uh, the discussion. Thank you for that. Um, we will now turn to our final presenter, Dr. Simon. Dr. Simon, over to you. Thank you. And thank you to Brown University for getting us together in this really vibrant setting because this is going to be quite a discussion, I can tell. So I am going to get to my I the floating meeting control so I can get to see where the buttons are. Thank you. And hopefully you'll be able to see the slide soon. Does that look okay? Great. So I'm I'm delighted to be in this conversation with Drs. Brown, Kudbursky, and Duggan and Brian to think of where we can accept the, the relationship between economics and health and think of in my in my few minutes, lessons we can take from past successes. So the way I'm going to approach this is to say, what has worked, and how does that help us going forward? I'm going to start off like several have. Like, this is, uh, was pretty similar to um, Professor Duggan's intro in thinking about the connection in, in economics to all of the things that happen are really an interplay. So when think of there being some threat to health and it interacts with policy, policy comes because of it, policy has a, an, an impact on it. And I'm gonna think of economic policy and, and public health policy as very closely related in that they both affect health and are dependent on people and society's reactions to all of the things that are being changed. So in the long run, you've seen pictures like this. I think we all have had a, a, a bit of this motivation. There's really very important things happening here, right? When looking at mortality, we had a 30-year gain in the last century in life expectancy, but in the quarter of a century so far in this century, it has not been very good. We've increased at a, a much slower rate, and then we had a decrease. And even though there's been a bit of an increase as the latest numbers in 2022 show, it's nowhere, it's not close to where we would have been in, in projected rates from where we go. So there's also a lot that 
a simple number of the total mortality doesn't show. We've seen pictures of what it is by education, by race. I'm just focusing here on the differences by race. And want to also underline that in addition to thinking about income, there are big roles that wealth plays and that there is a recent, recent paper that does a really good job of showing how wealth accumulation has been by race, the large gaps that exist. And so trying to think about the role of income, wealth, and social determinants as very comprehensively thought of and the connection to health is something we're doing. So there was a there was a, a, a publication that the CDC put out saying, let's look at the period of the completed century, last century, and what the greatest public health achievements have been. And in that were listed a variety of topics. And you can see the importance of public health and economics in thinking about declines in, in life, uh, in mortality and improvements in life expectancy. I'm gonna now compare as we go over time. So this was for the last century. Then there was a report the CDC put out that said, what about the first decade of this century? And you can see that there are some areas in common. So you can see vaccine, motor vehicle safety are being mentioned. A few new things are coming up. Tobacco control and cancer are, 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 are mentioned here. But there wasn't then, I guess in 2020, the CDC was busy with a lot of other things. And I, as far as I can tell, there wasn't uh, another publication that does cover this for the, the, the 20 years afterwards. But it's very clear there are some big public health achievements that have occurred in that more recent time period, one of which is the really dramatic and con, con ties to Professor Duggan's comments on how, how we can understand this together with the slowed growth rate of healthcare spending, right? These are just unprecedented numbers of, of declines in uninsurance in the US. We also know that with the awarding of the Nobel Prize in Medicine recently to um, acknowledge the contributions to humankind from discoveries enabling the development of mRNA vaccines against COVID-19, that there have been other big public health achievements in relation to the topics that have been mentioned before. Think about the vaccine, the role of vaccines has been in, in, in all of those time periods. Right? So lots of common threads here in the types of things we've seen as being effective in, in, in the past. But now thinking about you know, what are the policies that have the potential to advance health going forward, again, to come back to think about how, how economics helps understand, uh, how, how does it help in, in explaining that health impacts come from economic as well as public health. So I'm going to now join these two spheres and think about policy together. But that in addition to us having earlier thought about disease and injury threats, what we're all talking about right now, I think, is centering social determinants in a bigger way and thinking of policy and medicine recognizing more the role of social determinants. And then I'm going to, in my last minute or so, talk about a contrast in, in two areas that happens very recently. We can all just have lived through some of this and waiting to see what happens. The economics of vaccine development as an achievement in public health versus public, public policy in the opioid crisis. So in the time period right before the pandemic hit, we had been seeing a lot of policy that was addressing, trying its best to grapple with the changing sources of the opioid crisis challenges. Right? But in 2020, we started to get like the bandwidth of policy attention shifted away from the epidemic towards the pandemic. But at that same time, 
you know, what we didn't know at the time, because all this data is known, you know, even provisionally with quite a lag at the time, was this dramatic increase that was happening in overdose rates. When we break down overdoses into how much is due to overdoses of, that, that are connected to opioids, and then among opioids, type of opioids, it's really all coming from fentanyl. And this means it is a challenge because of the potency of the substance compared to the potency of the policy. We are really at a loss when we think about the changes in the, su the supply side versus the demand side, thinking about how to, how to design policy for an evolving and an epidemic, but we we had a very different approach to the pandemic, right? And so thinking of now, again, bringing back social determinants and thinking, even if we can't de deal with the supply side of a problem, doing as much as we can on the demand side and on treatment and social determinants, again, I'm just going to leave it at that to think that um, this is all going to be a re you know, really important for us to think about where where things go next and how much we have learned from past. And I think I turned it over to you. I see. Sorry, I had a little trouble with my tech once again. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, for the audience, this is uh, now the moment where we're going to have a little bit of a conversation about some of the presentations and the and and the the, the themes that have emerged, and uh, then we will turn it over to the audience. So please, again, do um, put your questions in the Q and A, and we will get to just as many of them as we can. Um, to start off the conversation, I thought I'd. Uh, a couple of themes come out uh, as I hear all of you and I've looked at your your presentations. You know, we're talking about big ideas of how the economy and policy affects public health. But as many of you have noted, it comes down to the individual. Uh, uh, and I, I wanted to maybe start there at a more granular level, actually, in um, where it's sort of more boots on the ground. And one of the policies um, that a couple of you have pointed to is wages um, and the impact of a specific policy like improving minimum wage and what it, that can have on health. And then it has trade-offs. So I wanted to maybe start with Dr. Brown Podorsky and ask if you could talk a little bit about how the impact of that very specific policy leads to better health, but also has these trade-offs. Yes, absolutely. And so indeed, there are definitely a number of um, trade-offs related to minimum wage policies. So for example, um, kind of going back to Dr. O'Brien's comments about the social safety net, so many of our means-based programs don't really take into account to the fact that minimum wages increase are so small. And it's but it's enough to make you ineligible for some of your your social benefits and without replacing like the financial um aspect of that benefit. And so if you're making an additional hundred dollars a month, but you're losing seven hundred dollars a month in childcare, that that makes it worse. There's there's a trade-off there. Um, and so I definitely would say, just kind of thinking about those two policies together, any change, when I'm thinking about large scale changes to wage policies, it has to consider the safety net and the means testing and those policies, which are not only um, kind of governed at the federal level, but at the state level and how eligibility is um, controlled. Um, you, you mentioned the, um trade-off of higher wages leading to things like higher BMI and um, and tobacco use. It, it's, I think that's a surprising trade-off to a lot of people, the idea that more income leads to perhaps behaviors that uh, then have an impact on your health. Could you expand on that a little bit? Yeah. And so, I mean, with higher income comes a little, comes more discretionary spending and some of those kind of more social behaviors that you engage in when you have a little extra money could become, which are in a lot of ways and some things that we examine considered negative health behaviors. And so, for example, if you have a little extra money in a month, um, at the end of the month, you may want to go out with your friends and go have a couple of, of drinks. That's considered in certain areas of research, like a negative health behavior, but 
So I, I can definitely see how that could happen when you have that increase in discretionary spending. And so I think it what is important is to make sure that we're contextualizing what that looks like. And a lot of times these analyses are looking kind of high level, looking at the state level of the, those outcomes kind of aggregated. But what does that mean at a more granular level? Granular level I think it's, it's going to be important as well to look at. Um, so those are my thoughts on, on that specifically. I wonder if any of our other panelists have thoughts on on a uh, on a wage policy that uh, could be more effective. Yeah, I guess I would just chime in and say, um, you know, in addition to wages, which are obviously you know critical when thinking about um, the the quality of 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 work, especially for those again who don't have a college degree, we can also think about a kind of other kind of components of these jobs, right? So in, in addition to the wage, there's also, um, you know, the right to unionize, the right for kind of uh, labor to organize, and that matters for, for other aspects of a job. So there's a lot of good evidence these days showing that, you know, schedule unpredictability or schedule volatility if if a if a person imagine kind of a, a young parent um, it, uh, doesn't have the ability to know on Monday kind of what their shifts are going to be over the week and they're at any moment at the beck and call of the manager who can say you know you're doing a tonight shift right it makes it you know extremely stressful and 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 borderline impossible to kind of manage a household and also kind of maintain that labor market attachment. So also just trying to think about you know what are the um, uh, 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 what are the structure of these jobs that people are actually able to build a life around. Um, and so there's, you know, minimum wage is, kind of, I think, one of, I think, a whole suite of labor market policies, job quality policies that I think will make a really big difference uh, uh, on moving the needle uh, on, on people's health. Mm -hmm. One thing I just like, oh, sorry, you go ahead, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Brown. Yeah. Um, the only other thing I was going to drop in is that we also have to keep in mind that minimum wage or the establishment of minimum wage goes all the way back to the 1930s. So these have just been around and just are being slowly updated. And so we need to really think about the context in which they were created and why it may require, I said, large scale changes. But that may mean a, an entire overhaul of how we think about wage here and in, in the country, um, because a lot has changed since 1938 specifically. Yeah, I was just going to add one thing on the minimum wage. Um, the basically today, the federal minimum wage in real terms is lower than it's been since the 1950s. But there's been a huge variation across states. It's now the case that California's minimum wage and many other states are actually in real terms higher than the federal minimum wage has ever been. And I think it's really interesting to sort of think about the heterogeneous sort of evolution of the safety net across states and. You know, in that, I'm calling in from California, one thing that you hear a lot of concern about here, and I think similarly in states like New York, is about a migration of people out of states that have the generous, more generous safety nets. So if you look, the, the basically the population, if you look at net migration from California to Texas, for example, or net migration from New York to Florida, New York to Florida has always been sort of the retirement thing, but it's much more than that now. And I think that really poses a challenge because increasingly we're having safety nets that are driven by state and local policies, but people are mobile. And to the extent that that is uh, inducing um, you know, people to move, it's just complicated, I think. And it, it, there's no easy answer, but um, California and Texas are in two very different places with respect to their safety net. And yet Texas is you know, just about the fastest growing state in California for the first time is losing people. Uh, and New York is hemorrhaging people. I mean, it's and 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 it it has a pretty generous safety net. So I think it's something important to think about that the changing role of the federal government versus state and local. <clears throat> and also on that point, I think what makes it difficult to change the minimum wage at the federal level is kind of to um Dr. Dugan's point is just a different context from state to state and the cost of living state to state. Um, and, you know, you have some states that allow, for example, their larger cities to raise the minimum wage as needed, but then you have other states who absolutely prohibit it, have passed legislation saying you cannot pass a minimum wage increase in your locale. And so we also have to consider um, that as well. I think we also have to remember that we can't just squeeze one part of the balloon because if we make wage policy change, we have to remember that we already said automation is a negative and that employers always has that have that as an option. And so it's such a delicate balance. The, the variability that you're talking about, and in fact, this is a good segue to discussing um, uh, employers as well. Uh, 
uh, makes me think of another theme that I was hearing a lot of you talk about, which is the connection between you know economic op opportunity and uh, mortality and 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 the deaths of despair that we see in so many parts of the country. Um, it's clearly tied from all of the research that you all are presenting to um, uh, loss of economic opportunity in your community, you know, broader even than the employees of the uh, companies that maybe pull out. Um, and I wonder, actually, thinking about possible solutions to that, I wonder if um, maybe we start with uh, you, Dr. Uh, O'Brien, um, is is the a policy to invest more in education and reskilling one of the answers to this that could help uh, bridge the disparities that we see between the haves and have nots? Yeah, it's a great question. So, I mean, I definitely think it's part uh, uh, of the answer, right? But, but I really want to stress that it's part of the solution because I think one of the, the problems, right, if you kind of we look at the evolution of policy discourse over the last three decades was it was always this kind of push for, you know, globalization will be good for the United States going to expand the pie. And then there is always a dot, dot, dot. And perhaps as long as we make sure that we share the pie more equitably and throw in some education and retraining, it'll all kind of work out. And I think that there's... Um, there are obviously some populations, especially if we start targeting young people in those communities where jobs have disappeared. Yes, absolutely. Investing in education and skills training is the answer. But when we think about folks who are, um, you know, in, in in middle age, in midlife, um, who've been kind of in a certain, uh, uh, um, you know, blue collar occupation their whole life, that job disappears, right? You know, I think it, if, if, if our answer from the federal government is, how about you, you know, go out and become a software engineer? I think I think folks hear that and it falls very flat. And so that's why it's trying to think about how we not only invest in people, but also really do invest in the communities, right? So how do we make sure that when a plant closes and those jobs disappear, that doesn't also um, turn into the kind of falling of the dominoes with a, a, a declining tax base. So then the school system is, is hemorrhaging jobs, the police and fire and all the kind of the public agencies. So trying to think about how, you know, as the we have the ebbs and flows of private investment, how do we make sure that 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 our public sector investment can kind of, uh, uh, you know, expand and contract to kind of meet those needs, right? So trying to think of ways to buffer these communities and not just make it so much about, oh, hey, sorry, you lost your job. It's an, it's an information economy. Go get some new skills. Again, I think that's part of it, especially for young people. But but I think we need to start becoming uh, 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 more proactive, especially for these cohorts were, were really hard hit. Um, another, I don't know if, is there, does anybody else want to speak to that issue of policies to I, reskill? I, yeah, I just wanted to weigh in on, on this because I think it is a really important point about the life cycle stages at which investments get made, right? So to think of trying to address problems in, in wage policy or redistribution afterwards, it's sort of the ex and like it's, it's after outcomes have occurred. Whereas attempting to intervene at early ages in education, it's like setting up the stage for us not needing to have policies later on, right? If we're very successful at being able to have skills that even if job markets and economy wide changes occur, that people have skills that are resilient and can, can, can sort of absorb the new shift to where the new new opportunities are. So this the 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 stages at which to invest in and really thinking about policies that have been successful at alleviating childhood poverty and giving equal you know opp opportunity increases that come at at uh, formative stages i think it's, it's a very important area to think of um i'll i'll ask one more question before we turn over to the audience we have a lot of questions coming in um a number of you also spoke about one of the big changes uh, in the last generation um, is, you know, a movement to have more people insured, reduction in the uninsured, but also a big movement to more and more government provided insurance, which is ironically increasingly privately run. And I wonder if we could talk about the trade-offs of more insur insurance, but, you know, uh, at what cost? Um, and I think Dr. Dugan used to spoke about that. Maybe you could get us started on that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, it's something that, yeah, I've thought a lot about, and I think there are uh, there can be tremendous benefits to expanding health insurance coverage. I have some 
recent research and a number of others have done this, that basically when people have health insurance, they get they tend to get better care and that tends to lead to improved health outcomes. Uh, I, I do think it is, I'm, I'm one thing that sort of, I, I, it really, um, I agree with so much of what has been said about the need for more investment in, uh, in let's say education and so forth. But I do think this health insurance price tag is, um, is going to keep growing for the government. So we haven't talked much about demographic change in the country and what's on the horizon. But I worry a lot. I, I'd stay up at night sometimes thinking about how are we going to do much if you think about right now a $1.7 trillion federal deficit when unemployment's pretty low and our demographics are better than they'll be next year in five years or in 10 years. So I think the, the Medicare is going to just grow more and more. Medicaid's likely to grow as states like Florida and others may, uh, may embrace uh, Medicaid expansion. So the role of, of government and health insurance is likely to grow. But I, I, I just I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to create a lot of fiscal challenges. Like I, I, I really don't know where the resources are going to come from to do this. At the federal level, uh, it's tough. And at state level, as we go increasingly you know, look at California versus Texas, just two completely different models to this. And it is, um, and that poses challenges to the extent that people strategically migrate. I mean, a number of states now are trying to finance, let's say, expansions in their health insurance or in the quality of their health insurance. We talk a lot about coverage. We don't talk much about what it means to be on Medicaid. How good is Medicaid versus how many people are on Medicaid? That, that we tend to focus more on the latter than the former, but I, I do think public health insurance can deliver tremendous benefits, but it is, um, I think that it there I, the, the financial constraints are, are pretty first order. I would really like it. I'll just say one thing. I'm here in Silicon Valley right now, and I think about all the amazing ways that technology and AI and so forth is transforming the productivity of the private sector and leading to all these improvements. I would really love it if we could figure out a way to leverage technology to improve programs like Medicare and Medicaid somewhat more, um, you know, we get, let's say, a new drug here and there, but um, I, they're just not fundamentally changing. And I think we as a nation may find ourselves increasingly needing to do more with less, not necessarily that I would, would want to say that, but just as the workers to re per retiree ratio is just going to fall and fall and fall and fall and fall. And how are we going to, um, how are we going to finance this um, growing role of public health insurance? I think it's going to be a huge challenge and I don't know how we're going to do it. Dr. Simon, you also spoke about the value of uh, of improving health insurance coverage. So what are your thoughts? I think that that's absolutely right what Dr. Duggan has been saying, that that we have problems that we haven't thought about how how we're going to be managing these as these, these challenges become greater in the future. One other factor happening is that, that, that health care and health insurers then what we're expecting as the role of what you cover and what 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 healthcare is responsible for is growing as we start to put more of the social determinants improvements into that realm, right? So it's not just your, it, it, and I think it's for lack of where else to put that, right? Because this is the area of growth. This is where insurance coverage is be having been expanded makes this a possible vehicle, but. You know, in an ideal setting, it's 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 somewhere else that we would be pushing for the improvements in social determinants, and then saying, okay, healthcare, just figure out how to do things efficiently and get the financing right, and don't you know, we put more in into the challenges that healthcare has to to grapple with. I think by doing this. Uh, I'd like to turn to our audience. The questions are piling up, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna just jump right into the list we have coming in, um, and start with Janelle Coleman. Actually, her question speaks to some of what we've just been talking about. Could the argument be made that the burden of health expenditures has been shifted to the individual, despite the expanding access to health insurance? I mean, that's a really fascinating question to me. You know, we have more health insurance coverage, we have more spending, but people feel like uh, their out of pocket costs and their own situation is not necessarily improved. I don't know if Dr. Simon, you want to continue your thoughts on I'd that? I'd say, yeah. So, so clearly there's been more, more attention to how financial costs are, first of all, not very transparent. And that's another issue in how well can the economics of choice work when there isn't as much transparency in where the costs truly are. 
But another is that there's more evidence of how toxicity in financial situations, right? So if you end up with debt, that can really affect other aspects of your life. And that again is a social determinant, how expensive people. It's also more apparent with research, how sensitive we are to even small out-of-pocket costs. And that changes the way we thought about how cost sharing would be something that constrained costs. Instead, we're encouraging reductions in cost sharing because it stops us from receiving care from from pursuing care so i think that what it what it means to be to to have financial responsibility both for financial protection that then affects other aspects of our life but also what the assumptions are about how to do cost containment are are, are evolving and cha you know changing in to the future will be not what we thought of in the past can i just add one thing on this i think the financial distress is that's there, but I think also the emotional distress for people to navigate the system and figure out what, what providers they can go to, and that is just changing. It's a harsh world. Things are changing from one year to the next. Every year, insurers are negotiating with providers. Providers get kicked out of a network, so you've got to figure out, okay, what do I do now? Or insurers that are contracting with an employer, they change, and so people have to change insurance. It's just a harsh, and 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 people are finding it harder and harder, I think, to navigate that system. And that is that burden is borne most by the most disadvantaged because a program like Medicaid, as much as it insures 90 plus million people, and I think that's wonderful, it reimburses less. So you just see doctor after doctor, hospital after hospital, just saying, you know what, we can't do it anymore. We can't treat Medicaid patients. And, and so that you have, um, it's even though we've had this, you know, remarkable expansion in coverage, I don't know that we've looked enough at what the quality, what that's done to the quality of that coverage. And I think it's just, it's really hard for people whose insurance isn't super generous to find, to just navigate, find out where do I go? And 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 I think people are kind of on their own in the system. And that's, I think that's, that's harsh. Any other thoughts on that? I have, we have more questions to get to and I can just jump right in. Um, so here's a question that speaks to, um, I think some of the uh, misaligned incentives in healthcare uh, that that don't necessarily always shift our resources toward prevention. And um, and sh um, Sheila Kolikopf, uh asks, how are the trends of hospital privatization and the higher compensation for specialist doctors, which discourages medical students from enrolling in primary care, being addressed in the context of healthcare provision and economic impact? Specialists make all the money. The people who try to keep you healthy, not so much. That's my <laughs> that's that's my riffing on the question. Um, uh, uh, I'll start with Dr. Brown Podorsky. Do you have any thoughts on that? Very brief thoughts. I would say some states do um, try to incentivize um, primary care providers to come to their area via loan repayment or. Uh, especially loan repayment. That's the big one that, that comes to mind for me. Um, so there definitely is the attempt to incentivize, but it's still something that I think is still way beyond just the repaying the loans um, for sure. But that's the scope of my knowledge on that particular incentive. Well, Dr. Dugan, you, you, you uh, spoke about the issues of um, the privatization of hospitals. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think the I, it's it's fascinating to me that this has been unfolding in states and cities throughout the U.S. that basically governments are getting out of the business of running hospitals. They just don't want to deal with it anymore. It's just complicated. It's just a drain on their energy. They want to focus on other things. And that is increasingly leaving many communities without uh, public hospitals that have often been considered the places of last resort. I think the compensation of physicians is a really important area and an understudied area, but it's well known to every medical student when they're entering that there's huge variation depending on what specialty they choose with respect to what they can earn in the future. And as an economist, I'm very much a believer that people respond to financial incentives. So people in primary care, it's a complicated set of reasons that I think we could spend an entire hour and a half on. Why is it the case that primary care here is so much less, there's so much less financial incentive to do it the 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 I, it's 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 complicated. I don't have good answers, but it it is. Um, I do think we do need to encourage more uh, more 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 med medical students to enter primary care because it's so important. And I think primary care physicians are really well positioned to help 
uh, be an ambassador or help suit patients navigate this just really complicated, opaque healthcare system. And I, I think they could do uh, great things if they were rewarded um, if they were re rewarded more. But it's it's complex. I don't have any simple like let's just give everybody a hundred thousand dollars a year more and that'll solve it. It's it's it it's super complicated. Yeah, and to kind of my earlier point and some a comment that was made in the, in the chat um, with the loan repayment um, opportunities or forgiveness um, opportunities, there's also the requirement that you work in a specific area for a, a established amount of time. And if burnout, we know burnout is an issue. And so if you're you're assigned to an area that has lower resources, higher stressors, there there may just not be enough having your loans repaid or forgiven may not be enough of an incentive to deal with that for five, six, seven years. Um, well, so I want to connect it to this discussion to something else I saw on in, in the chat, which is that healthcare workforce issues, really important to think about why it is that the rates we have, why the, the salaries are in, in the directions that are also has to do with scope of practice and limitations we put on what one has to have achieved as an educational degree and training and where in order to do what. And so if there are, and there are the, again, state laws that try to change this to say, what is what is practicing at the, at the top of your specialty like that is you're trained actually to do a lot more than perhaps you are legally licensed to do. And so we could be re reallocating who does what in ways that will lead to changes and incentives for more people to be in parts of healthcare workforces that are that are not as highly compensated currently. This relates to- there, the There's talk uh, to follow up on that. Please go ahead. <laughs> uh, the shift away from maybe having physicians deliver so much primary care and shifting more to nurse practitioners and, and physicians assistants. Um, there's a trade-off there, uh, but do you think that's a potential solution? Yeah, I think that the that that relaxing scope of practice, it seems like lots of research that suggests that that is you know, something we're going to have to think about as there aren't other easy solutions to these workforce, healthcare workforce challenges. But um, there was a comment in the chat about how, what do we think about the scope for nonprofit health insurance companies or nonprofit healthcare sector? We're seeing it as Dr. Duggan was talking about shifting so much into private and within private, even to venture capital and, and ways of really, right, really, really um, so much leveraging of capital. And it's because the, of the complexity we had in the Affordable Care Act an opportunity to have nonprofit insurance companies be on the same playing field, right? And, and it just didn't work out because I think of the, the complexity of the issue that it is not easy to solve without having a lot of financial backing. Uh, I think at this next question in the chat, in the Q&A section, it speaks a little bit to that issue of public versus private. Um, uh, an anonymous uh, attendee asked what, it's a pretty basic question, but it's a provocative one. What are some sources that could provide increased funding for social safety nets? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll dive in and I actually just want to piggyback on um, one of Professor Dugan's points, which is, as we think about uh, investing more in the social safety net, which we need to do desperately in the 21st century, it's going to bring these, these federalism questions uh, to the forefront, right? So what is the ro relative role of the federal versus state and local governments, and really this kind of federal state uh, division of responsibilities, right? So we've we've seen a lot of um, uh, expansion uh, 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 at the federal level through the ACA, through the Medicaid expansion, but the states are, are play an incredibly important role. And one of the things we don't talk about about the ACA expansion of Medicaid, right, is that states were still on the hook for 10% for of those uh, increased costs going forward. So wealthier states like California, New York, Massachusetts, right, that was a no brainer. Of course, you take 90 cents on the dollar. Um, but poorer states, right, the uh, folks, you know, places like Alabama, Mississippi, that just do not have the wealthy tax bases, right? The the fiscal um, trade offs there are uh, the 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 budgetary bites um, uh, uh, bites a lot harder there. 
So we have to think about going forward as we see increasing inequality between households is also driving increasing inequality between places um, that the federal government is going to have to play a bigger role, either directly financing uh, income support programs uh, or um, more uh, effectively and aggressively subsidizing poor states and localities uh, uh, if we're, we're going to require them to do that work. Because right now we have the system where we're getting pulled apart, where kind of wealthy states have the ability and the resources to tax um, um, to make those investments, and poorer states do not. And it really matters at the state and local level, those budgets do have to balance every year. Whereas the federal government, for better or for worse, you know, uh, doesn't have to. It can run those deficits. So when we think about where we're locating this conversation and where the potential for new money can be, we really have to be thinking about uh, uh, both the federal government as an initial kind of funder, but also being an important backstop for states uh, uh, as they're becoming increasingly unequal. I mean, a lot of states, to get to your point, Stephanie, too, are also just to build on um, what Professor O'Brien was just saying, that um, are using trying to implement wealth taxes. Um, so you see a lot of people from Silicon Valley gazing out the window, thinking about how wonderful life would be if they were in Texas with zero tax or Washington state with zero tax. Washington state recently implemented a capital gains tax, which really freaked out a lot, a lot of very high income people who are now thinking like, maybe I want to move out of Washington. So I think one thing that's really first order, you want to, you want to talk about raising serious revenue through state and local policy, state and state and some localities just need to be strategic because people will move, companies will move. You, it, like, and if if you know, we're so I do think I agree that if if you know if if you want to think about this, federal government is often more well positioned to think about redistributive policies than state or local policies. But I just look at the federal government right now. I mean, look at the look at the budget situation. It is like unbelievably bad, um, and it's and I. I don't know. Like, I, I just think that there, there needs to be, um, if if something's going to happen here, there's there's going to need to be a, a pretty major shift in the national discussion, and I, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, but I, I think that the baby boom, the aging of the baby boom, is just going to create whatever, however hard it is today, it's going to be harder in a year, harder in three years, harder in five years financially. And the, I don't know what we as a nation are going to do. Are we going to talk about moving more of our federal expenditures to investment? Rather than tra transfers, um, you know, anyone who wants to talk about touching Social Security or Medicare, it's like, whoa, not touching those. But anyway, so it's it's I I think it's a, a conversation that we need to have and not demonize people with one sentence bumper sticker. They like you know we we got to discuss it because it's a it's a hard challenge. I think if the country would come together, I think the country could come together um, uh, to to solve it. You, you both talked about uh, government solutions for the social safety net, but what about the private sector? I mean, uh, does, uh, who, is there a role, is there an increasing or a diminishing role in the private sector in the social safety net? I think that like in healthcare, what we're seeing is that the government is setting up the financing mechanism, but that the pub, the provision itself is private sector, right? So in that sense, there is private sector involvement, managed care, taking the role that the government, the federal government did in Medicaid and Medicare being a primary example of that. But I think also in, in other areas, the delivery being in the private sector is trying to harness the, you know, is there efficiency from paying this, paying in ways that will put the incentive on to private sectors to deliver more with the same dollars. I do want to just like on that note, just want to give a little bit of a I I mean, I'm not a, I don't study the retail sector that much, but I do want to give a little bit of a shout out to places like Amazon and Target and Walmart that put in place, uh, you know, voluntary minimum wage uh, that doesn't really bind in a state like California or New York, but does uh, bind in places like uh, Texas and other states without a minimum wage. And I think that that is you know, many people here have talked about um, the effects of income on health because income can buy you better food, safer housing, but, you know, just just how it can help in all sorts of ways. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's not in the healthcare sector necessarily, but I do think that um, some of the, some of America's largest companies are um, stepping up in ways that I think, you know, should be applauded and, and, and maybe other companies will mimic that uh, too. S 
so you you all have spoken quite a bit about the differences among states and how that experience depending on where you live can vary so much. This next question from uh, an audience member speaks to another kind of disparity. Um, it's from Margaret Grady, who says, certainly racial disparities are striking, but there are also rural urban disparities, which then intersect with race. Those rural urban disparities intersect with economic opportunities and health infrastructure like hospitals and policy which often is biased toward urban areas, structural racism. Uh, so I wonder if um, one of you wanted to start speaking to the, the whole ur urban rural issue, which also I think is um, intersects with the dis dis deaths of despair as well, but certainly even just access to hospitals varies wildly between urban and rural, right? Yeah, I could maybe start that off by saying that this is really a global issue. When we look at where develop, where there is fast economic growth and opportunity, things tend to be concentrated in cities, right? So people go to where those where where opportunity is. But then there becomes, like we saw during the pandemic, there was this exodus of, oh, there, there, there are also negative aspects of being in very densely populated areas and not being able to enjoy. And technology then allows us now more of those types of benefits that you don't have to be physically in place to as, as much as before. So I think it's going to be interesting to see as technology, you know, we've we just had a, a such a rush of the types of technologies that enable us to not be in that close proximity that was needed. So that was the, the rise of cities. Now is it is it that we're going to see more opportunity to develop in rural areas because of that? In healthcare, there's always going to be proximity issues, right? There's some things that you just can't have, even though telehealth is changing that, there's still the, the need for that to be very proximate. And so there's some areas where it's just there's there's limits to how much we can think technology can solve the rural urban issues. Um, this next question comes from Caitlin Jettling. Uh, a lot of the time, economy and health are pinned pinned against each other, pitted against each other. We certainly saw this with the pandemic. How can we better communicate the positive links that we are on the same team, particularly with populations that are losing trust rapidly in public health? Um, uh, Dr. Brown Podolsky, I'll start with you. I mean, I would say just to kind of keep it concisely, just being able to communicate that inequities affect all of us. It's not just those who we may or may not have pre-existing ideas about. It it really affects all of us. I think it's going to be kind of the the first step if we're able to make that do that communication consistently. Um, I think that'll that'll definitely be important to kind of jumpstart things. I also think that the public and perhaps nonprofit sector combined needs to, we really need to raise its game in this country and get better over time at coordinating. I'll just give you an example of in California over the last eight or nine years, homelessness has increased by 51%. And it is a area where it's really, you know, some really struggling people, lots of kids too, not just, uh, single adults, and it is just appalling to me that in the aggregate, state and local agencies are just all, they seem to be working at cross purposes. They're not coordinating. Data is siloed. You wanna just ask any even basic question about how are homeless people doing today? How are they changing over time? How are their kids doing in school? Have they recently been incarcerated? Are they in community college? Are they you know, were they uh, hospitalized with a uh, drug overdose? We're just, it's all these agencies are operating in these silos that are blindfolded and are not working together. And I think the public sector and, and everyone, tons of well-intentioned people that really have their eye on the ball and are trying to help, but it's just incredible to me. I'm, you know, I'm trying to uh, do some research on the California homelessness thing. And I've been so impressed by many of the people I've, I've met, but just these bureaucracies that don't work well together. And this problem is just, has really spiraled out of control and no one's in charge. And it's just, it's, it's very frustrating. And that's just a case study. This is not unique to California. This has been an issue in lots of cities, uh, uh, lots of uh, states uh, throughout the US. But I think the public sector, we, it just has to raise its game. Like 
if you think about how much better, like say what you will about a company like Amazon, you know, like whatever, I, I order from Amazon all the time. The retail sector has just dramatically improved over time from the perspective of consumers with technology and so forth. And the public sector just is not doing it. And we have to demand that from our elected officials and, and hold them accountable. I think a lot of people look forward, talk about this is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. And too infrequently do leaders and the people in their government say, let's look back and see how we did. How did that work? We did this policy. We pushed it through. Let's see how we did. There just isn't much of that. We're just always looking ahead, looking ahead, looking ahead, trying to create some new thing. And I just think it's really, I, the public sector desperately needs to raise its game on this stuff and work together as opposed to our cross purposes. I mean, how fundamental a problem is that uh, thinking about trying to enact all of the policies you were all talking about and make them successful if we don't have trust in public health? I think that's going to be the big question going forward, especially as we're seeing this alarming kind of distrust of, of evidence or equating, you know, our personal beliefs and feelings and how what we've known or known for a, a fixed amount of time, equating that with actual evidence. But then we're going to continue to have to really juggle that um, that for for a while when it comes to um, scientific evidence and evidence based policy changes. On that note, I'm, uh, I think we have, are out of time for the discussion. Uh, thank you all for a really stimulating dialogue, and I will turn it back over to Dean Galea. Well, uh, I'm simply here just to echo thank you. What a, what a terrific conversation, what a terrific set of questions and also comments in the chat. I think my um, simple takeaway is a comment that one of you made, which is uh, none of this can be reduced to bumper stickers. I just thought uh, th there was the, 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 the nuances that were brought to how difficult this is, but actually how critical it is to anybody who's interested in health um, uh, made this a really excellent conversation to start the year. To all our panelists and to everybody in the audience, thank you for participating in the conversation and thank you for everything you do. Everybody. Have a good afternoon, evening, morning, and uh, best to all of us in 2024, which looks to be a, a uh, an interesting year. Everybody take good care. <laughs>